so, you know, the first thing I wanted to ask you is just what it is to you to be involved in bringing this story to screen. It's such a emotionally powerful story and, and a story I'm sure that you, you know, you feel you want to do justice to. Uh, well, certainly that. And I, I think there's always a responsibility on a director when you're telling a true story that um, you, you have a responsibility to the facts, to the history, and also to those people whose story you're telling, um, not just to try and get it as as correct as possible, but to try and make a film that's going to have an impact that the story deserves. So, um, no, we felt that very powerfully as a, as a whole production crew from the beginning. Now, I want to ask about, you know, your history with the story. And, uh, you know, I, I guess most people um, first knew about the story through That's Life, through, through the, the talk show appearance. So first of all, do you rem do you remember seeing that at the time? And then my next question is, is you have a history with that show yourself. I do. Yes, <laughs> I do remember seeing that show at the time. And um, we have to give, uh, especially for a North American audience, we have to give context to what That's Life was. It was a British institution, a television, more than just a television institution. It was as live every Sunday night and one third of the population of Britain watched this show. So... Um, mm. That's huge. Um, it was a really strange mix of almost vaudeville comedy um, and quite hard-edged consumer and campaigning stories and, and human interest stories. Um, how it came together, I'm still not sure how that recipe, that magic worked, but it did. Um, I owe my career to the BBC where I got my first training uh, my first couple of years, and they did this scheme where they'd move you around from program to program. And um, one of my stops was as a trainee uh, researcher on that slide. Mm -hmm. um, so I did feel, I felt an enormous responsibility there too. And I'm now in touch with Esther Ranson and um, the group that's called the That's Lifers, um, uh, who who still connect daily. Um, uh, and she's she's she likes the film. She's willing to accept the way we portrayed her and she's very proud that she knows that she created she crafted there an extraordinary moment in global television history it still goes viral several times a year <laughs> now how did the feature film evolve and, and what was your you know you must have learned so much more about nikki witten than we saw when we see in that clip i mean he turns out to be a much more fascinating person than we even can see in that I mean, clip. He's an incredibly deep complex person i mean obviously when you approach that, or at least how I approach that, is I consume all the information I possibly can um, around the, the project. So in Nikki's case, we we based the film largely on the book um, that written by his daughter, Barbara Winton, as his biography. Um, and that's invaluable for me, but also for the actors, because it tells his story pretty much from birth through childhood to young man and helps anybody playing that role or directing that role to understand how that character came to be, what were the influences, what was his upbringing, what, what was his family that helped create the man who decided in Prague in 1938 that he needed to do something about this situation. Now, of course, um, the casting of Anthony Hopkins was so critical here. Um, I'd love to know what his early responses were to the project and then what this what playing this character was like for him because it it's really about a person who is just essentially decent and, and pragmatic and, um, you know, and he has to project those qualities as an actor. Um, initially, it was Barbara Winton who told the producers, you can have this story, but you have to get Anthony. Um, <laughs> that was the requirement, uh, which is no small ask. Um, then you go through a process, obviously, it's of passing information to the actor and his representatives to make sure that they think this is the right project for him. Um, and he clearly just chimed with, uh, obviously, we tell the story of the Prague Rescue, but we tell very much the story, the character journey of a man, an older man who's lived decades with grief and regret about not having done more um, during the war for these children. If you look at his life, in fact, which is not part of the film, uh, after Prague, he drove ambulances on the Western Front. Um, he trained pilots. And even immediately after the war, he was involved in the Committee for Reparations, going through um, Jewish possessions that had been seized and seeing if they were traceable and could be handed back. So his involvement throughout the process was of generosity, of doing the right thing, of decency. Um, 
Now, as you know, Nicky would have gone out of the way to say, I'm just an ordinary guy who saw something that needed doing. But clearly he was much more than that. He was emotionally connected. He used to talk about how to keep useful. He'd feel the emotion, but then he'd have to put a lid on it in perhaps a very British way. In some ways, an, a misfit as a child, as an eccentric. He didn't... Um, he... He um, his hobbies were pigeon fancying and fencing. He was quite a good fencer. Um, he struggled with relationships. He didn't find the right partner for 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 many many years. He was in many ways he he, he was a, a square peg in a round hole, and he just kept finding round holes. Um, uh, obviously, we know about his heritage. He he came from a, a German Jewish family who had escaped earlier persecution to, to arrive in, in the UK and in London. Um, and then there he was as a successful stockbroker, having been told by his father, a banker, to go to Germany and learn banking, which he did, as well as his German. And he had this extraordinary early career um, in early 1930s Germany. So immediately after uh well, in those years where Germany had this enormous debt to repay, where um, the currency was in free fall, and he was learning about what that was doing to a German society. And maybe that was partly what tuned him in to seeing what was coming and the threats to Europe eight years later. Yeah, but then to have the response that he did to just go so far above and beyond the call of duty, I mean, I guess part of it is the people... He wasn't acting on his own. He was working with a group of people. Which but... was very important for him always to acknowledge and was something the Winton family wanted us to be very um, uh, cognizant of in the making of the film, the telling of the story. Mm -hmm. So to, to talk about Doreen Warriner and Trevor Chadwick and Martin Blake as, as three of those people we embody, but also Hannah, who is in the film, she is a fictional character, but she is a conflation of the very many Czech volunteers who were also there and who were often far more in harm's way because for them escape was not so easy. Um, and, and that was an important thing that uh, Nikki would always say, look, I'm only getting the recognition because I lived longer than everybody else. Um, and I managed to get home. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, I have to ask just before we move on and just, just what, what it was, I know it was a very compressed shoot. You've, you had a, oh, a little bit over a month to film this, but just what it was like on a daily basis working with with Sir Hop, you know, Anthony Hopkins. Well, I mean, for any director, especially one um, you know, who's doing their first film with an actor like that, uh, there's a, there's a nervousness, uh, there's somewhat awe inspired. But he's such a collaborator; he has such a joy for the process. He enjoys every day of filmmaking. He wants direction. He doesn't come and tell you, this is how it is, I've rehearsed it, here we go, turn the camera on. Um, not at all. Um, and he's very generous to other cast members, um, willing to explore, um, and would always very humbly ask, have we got it, do you think? Do you think, was that was that good? So in terms of other cast members, you had this very interesting situation of having jo Johnny Flynn, an actor playing a younger version of Nicky Witten. So how did you handle that? And, you know, in terms of performance and production. Well, uh, Johnny is the perfect actor to be in that sort of role because he he is generous as well. And he is not the sort of young actor who's insisting on putting his own mark on the character. So he wasn't going to in any way undermine the whole. He was going to very much try and craft around what Anthony was creating. And Anthony's section was shot first. That was mainly for production reasons, but it, it worked very well. And, and Johnny came to set. He watched Anthony working for a few days. They sat and they talked. They talked about gestures with glasses and the way he held his head and things that they'd found separately from their research that became little signatures, little details that you then notice in the two portrayals. Um, and, and then Johnny really very humbly um, ref re reflects those in his performance, which we shot afterwards. Uh, we never intended to, it, it was never planned that we would intercut between the 1930s and the 1980s nearly mm. as much as we did. Mm. That was not the script. That mm. was the discovery in editorial. And it was partly enabled and certainly successful because of the seamlessness of those two performances. 
yeah, it works beautifully in the film. Um, the 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 location, the, the the past, the scenes that were were filmed in Prague. Very often in a in a in filmmaking, a different location is used, and you used authentic locations down to the train station. So could you talk about that? It's it's really remarkable what that adds. Yeah, to wherever we could. Again, I just feel even if the, and our audience will say, I don't care if they tell me the story, it's fine. Do you know what? Subconsciously, it makes a difference. The thing feels authentic. For the actors on the set, they know that they don't have to worry about the world they're inhabiting. It's real. And, and the, you could feel the history coming through the stones. Um, so particularly the main station in Prague, Wilson Station, we were on the very platform from which most of those kids left. So we right. were recreating those scenes literally along the same curbstones. Um, uh, and that that's an incredibly powerful thing to to feel and be doing. Um, obviously, we filmed on some of the main thoroughfares, on, on the Charles Bridge. Um, uh, the, the, there are some rules were broken along this. We couldn't afford to film in Whitehall at the home office where Babby, Helena Bonham Carter's character, goes to thump the desks. We ended up filming that in a building in Prague, which during the war was actually the headquarters of the Gestapo. Um, mm. So there's wow. a certain irony in some of the locations we were we did have to use. <laughs> and can you talk about the casting of, of the children in, in Poland that you did? Um, the, 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 the children in Prague, um, well, obviously we're Orange. very aware that they came from all sorts of different backgrounds from Germany, from Austria, from, they were Jewish, they were non-Jewish. Some of them were rural, some of them were quite wealthy urban kids. And we wanted our children to be dressed uh, and, and feel like they represented their tribes, if you like. So we went out of our way to cast um, ethnically correctly. Um, and I was terribly keen that we didn't have what I call stage school kids, whose performances are just too knowing. Um, and almost all the kids had never acted before. Uh, yeah. And I knew we would stand or fall by the performances of the kids. So we then hired a couple of, uh, in fact, a small team of child actor coaches in Prague who workshopped with them, with me and with the kids, so that we gave all the little family groups backstories mm -hmm. to help them imagine what it felt like to say goodbye to their mom or dad on the station, um, to tell them they'd come from a refugee camp, to describe what they'd left at home, the only possession they still had in their hands. And I think it works. I mean, the three boys who played the Slonic family, no, they're not brothers at all, but it didn't strike me for a moment that they didn't care about each other and feel the separation when that's what the story demanded. Absolutely. I have to say, I realized I was saying Poland. I said Poland before I, because I was yeah. you know, thinking so much in the film about the current refugee situation. And, and there's so much overlap. You know, I was thinking about Ukrainians coming into Poland. There's so much relevance on so many different levels in, in this story that must have you know been on your minds all, throughout. Uh, very early on in production, uh, I took the core crew, the designer, the cinematographer, the producer on a scouting trip to Prague. And we stood on that station platform I've just been describing. And there's a statue of Nicky Winton at the end of that platform. He has mm -hmm. a child on one shoulder, another in his hand. And we stopped to take our, you know, our snaps. Um, and while we were taking the snap, suddenly the whole atmosphere in the station changed. Something was going wrong. And... There was radio chatter and there were policemen and there were people in high-vis jackets and there was a crowd crossing behind Nicholas Winton's statue. And it was women and children, refugees arriving from Ukraine in the opening weeks of the war. Mm. And it brought us to a stop. You know, it, 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 even now it gives me goosebumps because it, it just felt such a powerful statement about why this film still has a message today. Absolutely. Um... I wanted just a few more questions. I want to ask about the 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 taping of the TV appearance. Um, and I, I don't believe Anthony Hopkins knew that there were going to be so many of Nikki's, you know, the Nikki's kids, as they're called, in the audience. So that must have been a powerful moment. It, it was extraordinary. And I don't think I was ready quite for the power. And the, the what came more unexpectedly was... I don't know why this was unexpected, but 
the amount of emotion that those individuals brought with them. Now, obviously, they knew their backstories at this point. They'd made the decision to fly from Canada, from Israel, from Italy, from Scotland, to be there and take part in, in the recreation. Um, we'd put them through costumes, so they would dress like their parents in the 1980s. And, um, and then they're there. And when that question is asked, if anybody here owes their life to Nicholas Winton, please stand. They stand because they really do owe their lives. They would not exist but for what that man did. And if you then turn and face the extraordinary emotion and compassion in Anthony's understated performance, um, it broke many of them. And the whole crew was just in tears. Amazing. So um, congratulations again on the film. And th thank you so much for, for taking this time to be with us. And good luck with the, with the rele theatrical release. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure, and I hope people rush out to watch it. They certainly will. Well, you're going to get good good word of mouth from the screening. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye.